wonder how you're feeling at the moment with uh, all this isolation that's going on. I know it's different, isn't it, to being able to continue to connect, but there's some good news there. Things are starting to open up and we look forward to being able to once again uh, come into a physical gathering together. But I thank you to God that we have this spiritual gathering that's still going on right now. And I guess the whole feeling of isolation would depend largely on your personality type and the situation you might find yourself in. I uh, read a headline this week that said, hey, introverts, stop loving this crisis so much. And I can say that from an extrovert's point of view, it's been difficult, it's been challenging. And in fact, I've found a lot of comfort in the pantry to tell you the truth of being isolated at home. Uh, I asked the Lord for a sign, and so he obliged with this. Uh, I, I asked him about that, and there it is. Yes, isolation can be a terrible thing. In fact, there was actually a study done on, uh, that tracked the lives of 7,000 people over nine years. And researchers found that the most isolated people were three times more likely to die younger than people with strong relational connections. They found that people who had uh, bad health habits like smoking and poor eating habits and, and no exercise and, and alcohol use and so on, people who had bad health habits but had strong social and relational connections lived significantly longer than people who had really great health um, you know, habits like jogging and, and, and food that was good for them and all that sort of thing, but were isolated. In other words, it's better to eat chocolate with friends than broccoli alone. That's what I'm saying, sticking to it as well. There was another study published in the, the Journal of American Medical Association. They infected 276 volunteers with the virus that causes the common cold. Now, I know in today's situation, that's, that's not something we'd want to be uh, going after. We've seen the effects of what a virus can do. Um, but it's true. I think there must have been money associated with it somewhere. I don't know why you'd uh, just line yourself up for that kind of test. But they did, and they, they, uh, they found that people with stronger emotionally connectedness and relational connectedness did four four times better at fighting off the symptoms of the illness, the cold, than other people who were isolated. People who were connected were less susceptible to the colds. They produced significantly less mucus. I'm not making this up. This is, this is actually true. This is what happened. They produced less mucus than those who are isolated. This is, this is literal. Unfriendly people are snottier than friendly people. That's the case. You see, we're made for connection. We are made for community. We're made to be in relationship, in family. And this is the power of love and community. This is the church. It's in our bodies. It's deep in our souls. It's ingrained in who we are. And it's needed by the world in which we live in. A couple of thousand years ago, Jesus called a bunch of people together, a group of people who loved God so deeply, who loved each other so irrationally and served the world so passionately that miracles started to happen. The Apostle Paul puts it like this in Galatians chapter 3. He said, in Christ's family, there can be no division between Jew and and non-Jew, slave and free, male and female, among us you are all equal. That is, we're all in a common relationship with Jesus Christ. All these things that had separated and divided people for so long became a part of God's family in and through Jesus Christ. And it was happening. These weren't just nice words. There had never been in the history of humankind a, a race, a, a community that, that even had an idea like that. That all the divisions and all the hostilities and all the enmities that separated people, that made them go to war, that made them not like each other, could actually be torn down and people could look at each other, whether they were slave or free, whether they were rich or poor, male or female, barbarian or Roman, and able to call one another brother and sister. What a great picture for our current climate. 
One where an, a relentless, all-consuming, Christ-centered love overcomes tensions between people with differences. Do you think God can still do that? Do you think it can happen today? Do you think it could be that there would be a Jesus community that is so relentless about loving people who thought they'd given up on the church, those who were no longer connected or even saw the church as a problem would look at us and the way in which we love and would want to enter that, that space, would want to be in relationship with those people People who are just so different racially, ethnically, culturally, economically, morally, generosity, generationally. Do you think God could do that at River Life? Do you think God could do that in you? The world that we're living in certainly is in crisis. We can see it all around us. There's no doubt that we've been in and continue to find ourselves in uncharted territory or so we think. This isn't the first time the church has actually had to deal with a global crisis of a pandemic of this sort. In 165 AD, and then again in 250 AD, and this is right when the church is very young, very early years of the church, there were plagues that came to the Roman Empire and wiped up, out up to a quarter of the population of a city. One historian writes, and says, at the first onset of the disease of the plague, people pushed the sufferers away and they fled from their dearest. Spouse from spouse, parent from child, throwing them into the roads bef before they were dead and treating unburied corpses as dirt. But amongst these horrific scenes, the early church followed Christ's example you see, Jesus would let lepers come up and touch him. He'd walk around looking for people who were blind or crippled, the outcast, the poor, the marginalized, to heal them, to care for them, to love them, to speak truth and hope into their lives. And the early church said, if that's what Jesus did, that's what we need to do. And they went out into those roads at those times and they picked up the sick and they brought them into their homes and they would bathe and clothe them and feed them. They would bury them. Sometimes they'd die with them. Sometimes they were healed. And again, lots of divisions, lots of, lots of problems. You can't romanticize the early church too much, but they eventually became this place that tried to do what Jesus did, what he said, what he spoke about. Now, I am not saying Ignore medical advice. I'm not saying become complacent with your physical distancing and your hygiene. We want to be sensible in all of those ways. But what I am saying in the context is this. Social isolation, which looked like the strategy of survival, can be deadlier than community. But we have a problem, don't we? Because the type of community we're used to, the type of fellowship that we're used to, that... Church has changed so much in these recent months. And our crisis is far greater, I think, than a global health pandemic, although it is terrible, or a financial crisis. There's a real crisis going on, and it's around the isolation of people. They need to find community. Mark Sayers, pastor in Melbourne and author, says that crisis precedes renewal. And boy, I hope he is right. But if it was just as easy as you have a, a crisis and then there comes renewal, we'd all have been millionaires after the GFC. We actually have to position ourselves for renewal when crisis is here. And I don't have to convince you that crisis is happening. And he talks about three stages of crisis. The first is this, he talks about disruption where you would say, what just happened? How, what, what's going on? We want this to end quickly. He then says that the second stage is a disassembling of the parts, where we're being invited by God to take a closer look at, at what we're doing and where we're going. Why does the church not feel like it used to? What if it never returns to what it was? 
What does this mean to my life? And what does it mean to be a part of the followers of Jesus in community together? So first disruption, then a disassembling of the parts. And then he said, can come a corporate and personal renewal. A recreation. And what does that invitation look like? Who is God calling you and I to be? Who is God calling the church to be? And no doubt, if you're like me, you still find yourself probably in stage one. What just happened? This all happened so quickly. And yet, unfortunately, the reality is it's probably not ending anytime soon. Now, there's some positive announcements just this last week, which is great, but I'm sure we'd just all like to click our heels together and say there's no place like home, hoping that everything would return to normal, whatever that is now. But if we truly find ourselves moving out of disruption and, and, and of the crisis towards the disassembling of the parts, what does that mean as far as the church goes? Is there a hope that the church is alive and well? What if it doesn't look like it used to? What is the future of the church? Why church? And this becomes then the invitation of who God is calling us to be. The church, God's always envisaged. Because in these current times of not meeting together physically, of limited shared community time, where we don't get to take communion together in the same way, we don't get to lay hands on for prayer, uh, this might bring up some serious questions in our minds about the whole idea of why church. And so for the next five weeks, we're going to explore what church is regardless of our physical circumstances that we find ourselves in. An op opportunity for us to redefine and to explore the part we all play in the role and the purpose of the church in preparation for positioning ourselves for the invitation of God to come into a place of renewal. It's really important that we, we know who we are if we follow Christ, then we're a part of the body of believers that comprises the universal church. Our true identity is actually a glorious one. It's an identity that positions us for action. Our invitation is always to remember our true identity and then to act upon that. And I realize that's not always easy to do. Part of the difficulty with remembering and acting our identity is the word church is used to describe so many different things. A church can mean a building, a group of people who gather together for worship. It's, it's used as a synonym for, for congregants or church goers or sometimes for the leadership, the decision makers within the local assembly. The word church can be used for a service or a meeting in which we do things that we, we come to understand as a church. So we say, are, are you going to church today? And sometimes it's church with a great big capital C at the front to describe all believers in Christ the church universal of all people who profess Christ as their Lord and Saviour and live for Him. But I want to examine what actually church true identity looks like a little bit closer. I had the recent privilege, and again next weekend I have the same privilege of, of holding and conducting a, a COVID wedding ceremony. Can you picture the bride on her wedding day? Her dress exquisite, her hair just beautiful. You can see her confident smile behind the veil as she walks down the aisle. Altogether, she's a vision of beauty, brilliance, hope, and promise. This is her special day, the one perhaps she's been dreaming about for a long time. And as she takes her place at the front next to the groom, she knows she's deeply cherished and highly valued. And the groom, he just simply can't resist her. And that's the picture of Christ and the church. Jesus loves us intensely as a groom loves his bride. And the metaphor is found in at least two places within Scripture in Revelation 21. You can read about it there, where the church is called the wife of the lamb. And in Ephesians chapter 5, 
Where the Apostle Paul encourages this, he says, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. We are his bride. And if we adorn ourselves for him, his eyes will be on us for good. Our identity is a glorious one. We are his beloved. And when we remember who we are, our true identity, we're able to act on who we are. And we're able to fulfill our destiny and live purposefully satisfied lives towards the end of the glory of God. Now, guys, I know that some of you are sitting back there and go, thanks very much, you're, you're, you're making reference, I don't kind of get this, I've never been a bride, I never want to be a bride, I'm, 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 I, I don't understand what you're talking about here. But don't worry, the Bible gives us several other metaphors that describe the true identity of the church. And another one can be found in Timothy. Timothy describes us as soldiers, In Christ, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, he says, Join with me in suffering. Not a great way to start a sentence, but anyway, join with me in suffering like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No one serving as a soldier gets entangled in civilian affairs, but rather tries to please his commanding officer. You can visualize Jesus as your commanding officer, your company commander. He's your guy, he's your captain, he's the man out in front who, is, who is, takes us through the battle. Under Christ's leadership, we are an elite group of soldiers. And it's our privilege to be led by Christ, the epitome of courage and of honour and of valour. And again, the point is that when we remember who we are, we're able to act on who we are. I don't know, maybe that one doesn't capture your attention either. Maybe like me, you've been watching far too much television during this period of time. I said I'd never sign up for pay TV, and well, that's happened. And so currently, we started watching a Netflix series, The Crown. It's the history of our current Queen Elizabeth II giving insight to what is referred to as the family. And in 1 Peter 2, it's the, the church here is described as a family. Listen to what it says. It says, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possessions that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. And the idea is similar The church is this called out, chosen, valued people group. Picture the church as the royal family, esteemed and set apart for service. And God's love for us is strong. And Christ is eternally committed to the church and his people. And the church is loved and chosen and empowered by God and set apart for a purpose that we may declare the praises of him who called us out of darkness into light. And it doesn't matter what biblical metaphor you'd like to to choose. Our identity is what's important. And the metaphors all point to the same thing. The church is loved, the church is chosen and empowered by God and set apart for His glory and His service. Our identity is an attractive, empowered, purposeful one. You see, at River Life, we're not trying to be a perfect church. What we want to be is a people who constantly align ourselves to pleasing God. And as people who position their hearts carefully and deliberately with the kingdom of God in mind, that God is pleased to work in unrestricted ways. And the more we grow to be like Christ, 
The more committed to his purposes we are, the more involved in his mission we are, we are the church. And we find great joy and satisfaction in our identity. The book of Colossians says that our riches are found in the heavenly realms. Christ saved us, he forgave us, he chooses us to do important things on this earth for his glory. We have a hope and an eternal future that is secure with him in glory. And the work that Jesus Christ did for us on the cross has provided all we need to be accepted by an infinitely majestic, powerful and holy God who invites us to live in his richness. So what's the problem? The problem is we can often forget that the local church belongs to Jesus and not to us. And forget this, and we begin to market ourselves more for our members rather than posturing ourselves for his manifest presence. It's so easy to go on the wrong trajectory So easy to move away from our true identity, particularly when at the moment we have so many things competing for for what is church in this unstabilized position we find ourselves in. When I was a teenager, we had to do orienteering at school and I was actually pretty good at it because I soon realized it didn't matter if you were the fastest runner. It didn't actually matter if you weren't the fittest kid If you stayed on course and you knew the terrain, you could win. If you didn't spend the time getting the right compass bearings, if you didn't understand where that next marker was on your map or read the map incorrectly, you could run as fast as you liked, wherever you liked, but you certainly weren't going to win. And many churches can take the wrong trajectory Many churches can have a a nice looking church building, fantastic ministries, contemporary and relevant music, well organized small groups, and still be on the wrong trajectory. Because the wrong trajectory is when we find ourselves moving away from our true identity. And right now, with so many disruptions to what it was like with all the busyness of things, we have opportunity in the disassembling of what's happening in this crisis to rearrange ourselves and to really think through things so that we might accept the invitation towards renewal. You see, a forgotten identity is when the church becomes too busy doing the wrong things. And the trick is that we often think that when we're busy, we're on the right track. A church can be filled with all sorts of activity and that's been stripped away. Services and programs, all shapes and sizes, their calendar is actually full to the margins. But if all that activity doesn't lead to spiritual transformation, if it's not centered around his manifest presence, if all that doesn't make its way into our understanding of church, then we're focused on the wrong trajectory. And a forgotten identity is when the church becomes the end rather than a means to an end. And we have the perfect opportunity as we're disassembling the parts of this crisis to grapple with our identity, to ask ourselves, why church? If we function under the belief that our only task is to get people into this building where I'm standing right now, we're we're spending our time running around as fast as we can, but maybe on the wrong trajectory. I may as well continue with the confession. We've not only been watching The Crown, I've been watching The Chosen. I hope you get an opportunity to do that. A series that follows the life of Jesus. I continue to be fascinated with how they portray this band of misfits called the disciples. And I mean seriously, Jesus gathered the most unlikely group of people to minister to the most unlikely people. There's this scene, and we find it in Matthew chapter 9 in our Bibles, and the series portrays Matthew as this brilliant mind, this, you know, slightly perhaps on the spectrum with a great deal of understanding about numbers, and he's not so great with people. 
And after all, he's a tax collector. He's a Jew working for the Romans, ripping the Jews off. So you can understand how he would not be liked in his community. And Jesus calls him to come follow him. And we pick it up in Matthew chapter 9, verses 10 to 13. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? And on hearing this, Jesus said, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice, for I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. What scandalized Jesus in the eyes of so many people, particularly the religious leaders, was how he would welcome, he would love, he would accept, he would embrace and include anybody who came up to him. It didn't matter Prostitutes, Samaritans, tax collectors, Gentiles, lepers, sinners, Romans, centurions. <laughs> they could all come to him. And so the religious leaders, when they looked at Jesus, said, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. That wasn't intended as a compliment, by the way. Jesus walked around and it was like he had this giant sign that hung around his neck saying, everybody's welcome at this family gathering. And his disciples, they didn't really get it. They were often appalled or dismayed themselves. But then after Jesus died and was ascending into heaven and and they waited just as he said and they waited in this room and they waited and prayed. And as they did, the Holy Spirit came upon them and the strangest thing happened to this community. This gathering of people becomes a place that never existed before where everybody in the world was welcome. The church of Jesus was born. In the Greek, the word translated in the New Testament that we have as church is the word ecclesia. It comes from the word ek, meaning out, from, or to, and kaleo, which is meaning to call. And it has to do with this group of called out people from one place to another. It's an assembly or a congregation, a gathering. And the Ecclesia in the New Testament is a group of people who have been called out of this world and to God. This is the church but we need to be very careful in our understanding of what it means to be called out. That we don't forget our true identity and go down the wrong trajectory. Some people think that being called out as a Christian, that we develop a Christian subculture and this then becomes the focus of the church. Are you familiar with what a Christian subculture is? The whole idea is when we have our own language we have our own fashion, we have our own, you know, books that we read, music that we listen to, movies that we watch, conferences we go to. And the Christian subculture is generally characterized as a safe and nice place to be. It's easy to gravitate towards it and just settle in. But in the disassembling of parts, I think there's a challenge to try to find our true identity about being this ecclesia, these called out ones. Because many of the products that are geared towards that Christian subculture, they're not bad in themselves at all. They often are there to help disciple and to grow us as believers, but toward what? As long as then that is not the end. It becomes a means to an end because the identity of the church is not that we shrink in. God never intended that we be a subculture unto ourselves. Rather, he asks that we would be counterculture, a culture that does what is right and true and good, even when the darkness is all around us. Jesus said that we are to be salt and light to the world. And he asks that we remain in our culture, that we would be in the world and yet not of the world, so that we can be influencers of a crooked and depraved generation in which we shine like stars in the universe, it tells us in Philippians. 
We are to love people as God loves people. Share his invitation of salvation with them and pray that they too will hear the call to join his family, his church. Pastor Wayne Cadero puts it like this. He says, when a church forgets her identity, when she becomes busy doing the wrong things or she becomes an end in herself or she becomes too focused on the Christian subculture, then the pioneer spirit is quenched and the bride of Christ is always supposed to be a pioneer bride. That's a curious mixture of metaphors, he says, but the Lord says we are sojourners of citizens of heaven. We must never lose the heart of a pioneer bride, a heart that's always adapting, always changing, seeking to live out our true purpose and to reach a dying world for Christ and inviting them into an inclusive, welcoming family. And the good news, in the current situation, is that if we take time to say, why church? If we take time to answer that question. If we take time then to remember our true identity and discover the meaning and the purpose of church and ourselves, then we will thrive into a place of renewal. We come in so we might go out. And right now, in our current environment, what coming in looks like has really been challenged. And also being challenged is our motivations for gathering. Why church? Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23 to 25, becomes a beautiful little summary for us. And it says, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. One of the things that signifies the family gathering of the church is communion. I like this understanding and how God set it up to be that one of the best times around most families is when you gather at a table to share a meal together. And when we come to communion, we again gather together around perhaps a much smaller table or a much smaller meal, but an incredibly rich and significant one. The taking of these elements, they remind us of our true identity and purpose. It keeps us mindful that we're a part of the family because of the love of Jesus who gave up His body, who shed His blood. His arms were open wide on the cross to welcome in all into a family who would believe in Him, who would lean on His grace, who would turn from their own ways and would turn to God and seeking His forgiveness and entering into a new life, born again of His Spirit. And today, if you have not responded to Jesus and asked Him to forgive you of your sin, today could be a very special day to take communion to be welcomed into His family. The opportunity is always there. And nothing the Bible tells us could ever separate us from His great love. A love that was most demonstrated and never more clearly spelled out than when He went to the cross. Leaving the glories and the riches of heaven, He came to earth to live a life without sin, a life on our behalf to bridge an unbridgeable gap in or of our own strength. The separation that our sin places us in between us and our Father in heaven. And Jesus came to bridge that by His ultimate act of love in sacrificing Himself, the perfect sacrifice, the one who'd never sinned, who took upon the sin of the world so that we could come into His family. 
And then we could extend the invitation like I'm doing to you right now, the invitation to all, that all would be welcome. All could find themselves in this community, this family, this gathering together. It tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And Paul says, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night He was betrayed, took the bread. And when He'd given thanks, He broke it. And He said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup. And after supper, he took the cup saying, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat of this bread and you drink of this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. As we contemplate what Jesus has done for us, Spend the next few moments eating and drinking the juice and the bread. And then we'll come back and we'll pray together. And if today it is that you want to respond to be able to be a part of His family, then why don't you engage online and talk to a pastor about that. Click that I've made a decision to follow Jesus, commit my life to Him. And we'd love to be able to help you on your journey and on your way. Why don't we just spend these moments now, whoever you're gathering with, or if you're sitting by yourself, then remember Holy Spirit is there with you. And just take time to think on why church, our true identity found in what Jesus has done for us.